If you've lived long enough, chances are you've undertaken some kind of project that didn't go quite according to plan. Maybe you tried repairing your kitchen sink and ended up with water spraying everywhere. Maybe you replaced your car's spark plugs and ended up blowing the engine. You get the idea. Fair warning, this video was one of those times for me. Pretty much everything I did in this video backfired in some way. The ending's gonna be a little disappointing, and even a lot of the footage turned out to be either missing or unusable. Even this master shot's taken me four tries to get right. It's been a year-long saga, and at this point, I just need to get it out there in whatever form I can and move on. But let's dive in, and I'll tell you all about it. Ah, the 1980s. The decade when shopping malls ruled, cops wore pink, and the New York Mets were actually able to win something. It was also the decade when mobile music became truly portable and popular, and that revolution was led by the Sony Walkman. You really feel the music with the Sony Walkman? The Sony Walkman is a tiny stereo cassette player with truly incredible sound. Before the Walkman, we had transistor radios, larger portable tape recorders, and these things that probably evolved into boomboxes. Sony themselves already had Walkman-sized cassette players, but they were mono devices intended for journalists. So the Walkman wasn't the first at any one thing, but it was the perfect combination of a lot of things that had only been done individually before, and at just the right time. The original Walkman was a stereo cassette player that you could carry in your jacket pocket or on a belt clip. It was an immediate hit and became an empire unto itself that lasted decades and spawned hundreds of individual official Walkman models, not to mention knockoffs from other companies. If you watched my video on cassette decks, you heard me say this. I wasn't buying these to collect at the time, I was buying them to listen to, mostly in my car, although I did have a home deck and some kind of off-brand Walkman as well that I don't really remember. Yeah, not all of us could afford a real Sony Walkman. Sony was the main driver of the product category and consequently could charge pretty much whatever they wanted. The off-brand knockoffs, though, ranged in quality from as good as the original to dime store garbage and with the prices to match. I had one of the latter, just something that would let me listen to tapes without bothering anyone around me. But I always, like up until last year, wondered what I was missing. After making that cassette deck video, I finally decided to find out. You also heard me say on that video that while I'm not really a fan of cassette as a format, I do love the hardware, and I've always admired the Walkman for its engineering. Sony has basically never stopped making Walkmans, or Walkmen if you prefer. And in fact, I have a modern one here. This is a great, great little modern digital audio player that only cost me about $150 new, and it plays every non-Apple format under the sun, including DSD, lossless FLAC, and uncompressed WAV files at very high bit rates. It's a high-res player for cheap. I highly recommend getting one of these. But now I wanted a Walkman from the 80s, when it was iconic. I still have a bunch of tapes that I've owned since I was a kid, and I do still listen to some of them. But I didn't have a portable player at all anymore. I searched around and ended up late night drunk buying this WMF-102 on eBay. That's a dangerous thing to do, but its styling just screams 80s with its silver case, teal accents, and diagonal striped design. It's just the look I wanted, and it's got Dolby B noise reduction, which was a high-end feature on portable players in those days, as well as auto-reverse in an all-metal design. It also appeared to be in reasonable shape. Now a little more obvious foreshadowing here. Part of what I'm trying to show in this video is that buying and fixing up miniaturized analog devices like these can be a minefield, as I discovered firsthand. There's a reason why Walkman restoration is almost a hobby unto itself. There's a lot to learn before you get good enough at it to not constantly screw up. And one of the things you'll need to learn is what Walkman models to even look for and what to watch out for when you buy. Basically all Walkman that have not been restored will be in non-working condition these days. And that's often a simple fix. You guessed it, the belt. Restored or even just rebelted and cleaned, original Walkman can go for upwards of $400. But non-working ones often sell for under 100 Absent some obvious damage or other issues, I knew it could pay to take a chance on a non-working unit. 
Now, if you're a Walkman collector, then you probably know that the WMF100 specifically has some weaknesses and caveats. The first of these is the battery and battery cover. These were among the first Sony Walkmen to come with rechargeable batteries. In this case, Sony's gumstick design. This is not a battery type that Sony still makes, and it's not a standard in any industry either. So eventually the original batteries all died and there were no more. Luckily now, a few companies do make new replacements, so I knew I'd probably need one of those and a way to charge it. You can see the dollar signs already starting to add up here. The battery cover on Walkman of this era actually holds the battery and includes its contacts. So unlike another device where the cover just keeps the batteries from falling out, in these models it's really kind of essential. And in the WMF100 series, these are held on by just three thin lugs. Originally these models would have come with two battery covers, one for the gumstick and a larger one for double A's. But people seem to tend to lose the one they didn't use, so mine only came with the gumstick cover. And of course one of the lugs is broken. I only noticed this later. I ordered a new belt, battery, and charger the same day I bought the Walkman, and while I waited for it all to arrive, I downloaded the service manual to figure out how to open the Walkman up. I know some of these are easier to get into than others. Probably should have checked this before buying it, but I got lucky in that this model just has two screws on the side and two on the back, and then it just pops right open with immediate access to the belt. When the new battery and charger came, I tried charging the old battery first. I did so under strict self-supervision, because who knows what condition this battery is actually in or what it could do when a charge is applied, especially with this somewhat sketchy charging solution. Luckily nothing happened, but I mean nothing. It charged for a few seconds each time and then stopped. So on to the new battery, which ended up charging just fine in this goofball charger. I knew a tape probably wouldn't play, but I tried out the radio with the new battery and it worked and actually sounded great. But I noticed it just kept shutting off unless I manually held the battery up against the body of the Walkman. Initially I thought the new battery was a little too big, but this is when I saw that one of the lugs was no longer present to hold it in place. That was causing it to make intermittent electrical contact. Some of you may see something else that I didn't spot until later the back of the case is cracked. There's also a dent on one corner of the door, so I suspect that this unit was dropped, as many of these were, possibly repeatedly. There's no easy solution to the broken lug. It's a physical break of a very small, brittle piece of plastic that fits into a very small slot. This plastic needs to be fairly strong to hold the battery contacts up against the Walkman reliably, but these things are not strong anymore, and there's no good way to fix that. Though I did try, and I'll show that a little later in the video. I searched for more battery covers on eBay and only saw one or two in several months of searching, and these were more expensive on their own than just buying another WMF100 with its own battery cover. So that's what I did. Another couple glasses of wine led to my second WMF100, which was advertised as being complete with both battery covers. Truly a rare find, and not even that expensive. Even if one cover was broken, hopefully the other wouldn't be. I was even hoping that if both were okay, I'd get two working Walkmen out of the deal. But if not, nothing wrong with having a parts machine. But the eagle-eyed Walkman collectors among you may have already spotted the fatal flaw with this plan. The new Walkman even came with the original charger. These are pretty rare, either as part of the package like this or separate so I wouldn't have to rely on my questionable third-party charger anymore. And it was black, so I'd get to experience both colors that Sony offered this model in. Luckily, both battery covers were in perfect condition. Of course, just like my silver model, this one's original battery was dead, but it worked fine with the new gumstick I'd bought. It worked just as well using an Eneloop AA battery with that cover, and all the lugs are intact. Huzzah! Well, imagine my surprise when I tried to put one of the covers on my original silver model and it didn't fit. <laughs> now, I think the real lesson of this video is don't drunk browse eBay. You see, my silver Walkman is a WMF-100-2. The black one is a WMF-101. The difference? The battery cover. The lugs are about a millimeter or so off. I don't know why they changed this, but they did. 
Well, okay, there are some internal differences that I discover later and that are meaningful as well, but I'll get to those in due time. I think part of the reason this Walkman didn't sell for more may have been that a few pieces of the front trim had fallen off, but these were included in the box and I just glued them back on. Looks good as new now and they'll probably last just as long. Since my original silver unit still didn't have reliable power, I decided to rebelt the black one first. The first time I popped the cover off, I ended up nearly flinging it across the room. Yeah, yeah. I got better at this as time went on. Now it just lifts right off, like a tiny desktop PC. Sure enough, the belt had melted into many pieces of goo. I set about using some alcohol to clean the old belt off as well as I could. The new belt was pretty fiddly to get in place the first time. Both it and the channel it fits into are super thin, so anytime I'd put it around a new pulley, it'd want to pop off the previous one. But eventually it went on, and I was ready to test it out with the new battery. Incidentally, this is also a skill you can build up over time. I can now pop the belt off and on in about 5 seconds. With the new belt, the black Walkman sprang to life and began playing tapes. So at this point, it was basically working, although I noticed an odd thing in that the auto reverse would not engage manually. It did still work automatically at the end of a side, so it's not the mechanism itself. <laughs> this may seem like a small thing, but I discovered that in practice, it kind of isn't. See, it's an auto-reverse deck, and that mechanism is always on to some extent. The two modes available on this model are looping auto-reverse, where it just keeps playing forever, and both side play, where it just auto-reverses once. But in either case, it still auto-reverses at the end of a side. That means that if you get stuck on the wrong side, there's nothing you can really do to fix it except fast forward to the end, then press play and let it reverse itself. You could of course just live with it, but then you end up putting in a tape, pressing play, and hearing the wrong side half the time. It's maybe more annoying than it sounds. It's like putting on a record on side A and instead having your turntable play side B. Or like when you forget you've got shuffle mode turned on on your phone and you try to listen to an album all the way through and the second song that plays is some random song near the end. It meant that it was just not really fun to use this thing, and that was kind of the whole point of buying it. So my next steps were to order another new belt for the silver unit, reset my eBay searches looking for yet another new battery cover for it, hoping to get lucky at some point, and set about trying to figure out what I could do about fixing the auto reverse button on my black one. The service manual was somewhat helpful in that it showed the mechanism in pretty good detail, and opening it up it seemed to me like everything was in good working order except one part, the solenoid. There is a little solenoid that actuates when you press the reverse button, and that's what transfers your mechanical key press to the mechanism itself. With the mechanism exposed, I could move it with a screwdriver and get it to reverse manually, but pressing the button just wasn't activating the solenoid. I looked up that solenoid, and it's not really available that I could find to buy separately anymore. And anyway, it's a tiny part in a sea of tiny parts that I don't have a lot of confidence my Jolly Green Giant hands could cope with. I again briefly flirted with the idea of just cannibalizing one of these machines for the other. The auto-reverse mechanism is the same from what I can tell, but it seemed like a waste to do over one tiny solenoid. So I put aside the black unit and decided to see what I could do about rebuilding the missing lug on the existing battery cover I had for the silver one. I'd seen mention online of trying various goofy things like melting a piece of wire directly into the remaining plastic, or using epoxy to fashion a new lug. The former seemed a little unreliable to me. Wire bends, and if you melt the plastic the wrong way, you've pretty much destroyed the entire cover at that point but epoxy seemed at least possible, and pretty non-destructive if I messed it up. So I bought some JB Weld plastic epoxy putty, stuck a blob of it on the corner of the cover, let it cure for 24 hours, and then set about sanding it into the shape of a lug. Some of you can probably see where this is going. <laughs> when I got near the thickness required for it to fit inside the lug hole, the whole blob just snapped off. Oh well. Epoxy is more brittle than you'd think, and it still didn't bond all that well to the existing plastic. 
There may be some that stays a little more pliable than what I bought, but I didn't really want to go hunting around trying a bunch of different epoxies. Given my issues with both units, I just shelved the whole project for a while. At least at that point, I knew the Black Walkman was usable, if not very enjoyable. Fast forward, no pun intended, to a couple of months ago, when suddenly this thing popped up on eBay. It's a USB rechargeable gumstick size battery case with its own battery, specifically made for the WMF-102. Jackpot, I thought. Only one was available, the seller said they're not making any more, and it was $39, which is actually reasonable compared to the prices official battery covers alone normally go for. I went ahead and snagged it before anybody else. Eventually, whatever battery's in there is gonna die itself, and it doesn't look removable, at least not by design, but hey, I figured maybe I'd get a few years out of it. That'll be good enough for now. Meanwhile, the excitement of hopefully being able to finally get my silver model working led me to pick up my black unit and just see what state it was still in, since it had been a while at that point. I put in a tape and noticed how warbly the sound is. That's all I can describe it as, warbly. It's not really a speed variation, the new belt's doing its job, but a change in tone or timbre, like the tape isn't being pressed against the head hard enough. I had a few things to try to fix that, but in a fit of the why nots, I found myself just jamming the reverse button repeatedly for no real reason, and wouldn't you know, manual reverse suddenly started working. I swear I did this before. I know I pressed it hard, but I'm pretty sure I pressed it repeatedly like this too. Oh well, who knows? I did know that not much can really go wrong with a solenoid other than getting jammed, hence my thought to try it now. Try it now! Try it now! Try it now! Dang! Just goes to show, sometimes that actually works. So I technically have a fully working WMF-101 right now, but it just doesn't sound very good. Well, let's see what can be done about that while we wait for the new battery and cover for the silver unit. I bought this speed and wow and flutter test tape, which yes, is homemade, and I don't know how accurate it is. It was made on a better deck than mine with quartz lock speed control though, so hopefully it'll do. I did a basic speed and wow and flutter test to see how bad my Walkman really was. I discovered that it was running a bit slow and also had pretty high wow and flutter. You can see a peak here of between 0.4 and 0.6% with an RMS of maybe 0.3 to 0.4 or so. The speed is easy to fix. There's just a pot on the main board I needed to adjust. Wow and flutter though is one of those things that can get worse over time and there's often no single fix. You see kids? Analog equipment is fundamentally different from digital in that sound quality can degrade at the point of the transport itself. A digital transport is basically going to work or not. You can get degradation at the analog conversion and amplification stages, but with analog equipment, you've got all these moving parts and they all can affect the sound right from the beginning of the audio chain. They will all degrade over time. You just have to decide what level of audio degradation is acceptable to you before something needs to be serviced or thrown in the bin. Often it's kind of like the proverbial frog in the pot of boiling water. You may not realize how bad the sound has gotten on an analog device you own until somebody tells you or you hear something new. But when you buy a piece of used equipment that's new to you, it's usually pretty obvious in that case too. I noticed during the speed test that the flutter was not totally random. The worst of it had a rhythm, like the motor or belt was catching on something every time around. I opened up the back case again and gave it another thorough cleaning. I was surprised at how much more old belt goop came off. I did see one spot on the motor pulley too where there seemed to still be a small blob that may have been causing that rhythmic bump in the test tone as the belt passed over it. With mechanisms this tiny, everything in the drive chain has to be spotless. Even a tiny bit of residue can cause a noticeable fluctuation. I also re-cleaned the playback head and the cap stands and pinch rollers. Again, they were still a lot dirtier than I thought they were. I also demagnetized the head and as much of the mechanism as I could reach. I've never found this to make much of an audible difference in any cassette deck I've had, but it is usually recommended to do every hundred plays or so. I then put a drop of oil on all the spinning metal parts, though not the plastic since the oil I have is not plastic safe. 
Nothing in the service manual mentions lubrication, so I don't know if this helps anything. But again, I figured, why not? I then retested the wow and flutter. The speed I managed to get pretty close. It's a little different in each direction, so it's always going to be a bit of a compromise. And the wow and flutter is, well, better. It's still not fantastic, as you see here. I managed to subtract maybe 0.1% from both my earlier peak and RMS, but I don't know what the original spec on this model was anyway. It may not have been much different than this. It's not listed in either the customer manual or the service manual, so it doesn't seem like Sony was all that proud of it. 0.3% wow and flutter wouldn't have been that far off from average for portable cassette players in those days. I doubt I can improve it any further in what's now a 40-year-old machine. All those tiny little imperfections that have developed over the years add up. I then did another listening test and it sounds okay. Now, again, I admit to being a bit of a spoiled brat when it comes to audio quality these days. But then, really, aren't we all? With all the talk of compression and loudness ruining sound quality these days, that's mostly to do with recording and mastering. But in terms of playback, even a well-recorded, well-encoded 128K MP3 is going to sound better than almost any cassette in almost any cassette player. Just a little tangent here, because I know I'm going to catch grief about this in the comments. There are plenty of double-blind listening tests out there that prove that however good a listener you think you are, humans have a really hard time distinguishing a well-encoded 128K MP3 from an original uncompressed WAV file. This isn't just my opinion. Those tests are out there and you can look them up. So to a large extent, I'm probably going into this just hoping for too much out of these players. The original point of the Walkman was to give people a way to listen to music on airplanes. It was never about sound quality. It was about toughness and portability and creating a sound profile that could overpower jet engines. That's it. Like a lot of auto-reverse cassette players, portable or not, my WMF-100 sounds better in one direction than another. In reverse, it sounds relatively good, with clear bass, mids, and highs. In forward, the highs are basically missing. I'm guessing that's the azimuth, which is the angle of the tape head in relation to the tape moving across it. Over time, especially in a portable player like this, where the head is literally held in place by a piece of thin plastic, the azimuth can drift. It may not even really be fully fixable at this point. There is an azimuth adjustment screw, a single one which affects both forward and reverse, so you can either have one direction really dialed in and the other just okay, or you can compromise a bit in both directions. I did try adjusting this screw, but it is really, really locked in there. Manufacturers generally used thread locker on these screws from the factory, and it is a very tiny screw with a very tiny head that I didn't want to break or strip. It's also held in by that same thin strip of plastic that's also 40 years old. I don't want to break that either. So I'll probably just live with the azimuth being a bit better in one direction than the other. Incidentally, the WMF-102 has two adjustment screws, one for each direction. So it seems like by that time, Sony had figured out that this was a potential issue. Since I was kind of at an impasse with the black Walkman, I went ahead and rebelted the silver one with the second belt I'd ordered. Same process, so I won't go too deeply into that. But shortly afterwards, my battery and battery cover arrived from Singapore, and there was much rejoicing. This would be the first time I'd really been able to listen to my WMF-100 too. I charged it up until the light turned blue, which didn't take long, stuck in my copy of Jane's Addiction's Nothing Shocking, and hit play. And suddenly I was in a state of sonic bliss. No wait, I wasn't. In fact, it took a few taps for the motor to even spin up. Then it was clearly playing really slow. I thought maybe the battery just hadn't really charged, so I charged it again, this time for longer. Same result the second time, and I noticed it was also reversing itself quite a bit. It feels like there's some resistance happening somewhere. It is an old player that may not have been used for decades, so there could be some dried grease or oil in there mucking things up, or maybe something worse going on, considering the dents and cracks in the case. I took the belt off again just to see if the motor spun freely, and it kinda does, but it also rattles something fierce. With the belt on and playing at normal speed, that rattle becomes a whirring sound that my other Walkman doesn't have.
If I move it manually, it's a regular click at the same point in each revolution, almost like something's stuck in there. I did the same wow and flutter test, and it also flutters rhythmically like my other unit originally did, but I re-cleaned everything, and there's nothing obvious on the outside that would cause that. It is audible, too, unlike the wow and flutter on the other unit. I oiled everything up and let it sit for a while, and it started running a little better, but it's still not right. The speed also changes depending on the unit's orientation. I've seen suggestion that these models are prone to old grease getting stuck below gears that are on the inside of the unit, so you need to take it fully apart to get to them. But I'm not sure that's my unit's entire problem, though it might be part of it, because of the noise the motor makes even when spinning on its own. I have checked for cracked gears or gear teeth. I can at least see all of them with the amount of disassembly that I've done, and they all look fine. I think it's just the motor. So I think that's where I'm going to have to leave things for now. Again, not the most satisfying ending to a video, but at this point I have one technically fully working WMF-100-1 and a WMF-102 that may just need a deeper servicing, but may need a new motor as well. But this again is part of the point with all the videos I make about analog equipment. This stuff is fun to look at and use, and it can be fun to work on if you're into that, especially if you can have a successful outcome though my eyes and hands aren't really made for working on Walkman. But in terms of serious listening, it's just not the best tool for the job these days. We used portable players like these at the time because they were better than what we had before, which in most cases was nothing. Nowadays we have stuff like this for a really high quality experience in an even smaller package. But even your phone will do better than a cassette Walkman if what you want is good sound. Just make sure you're buying or streaming good recordings. So don't go out buying one of these looking for something it's just never going to be. Yes, I realize there are better Walkman models out there. Every time I post a video like this, someone writes a comment to the effect that you've just never tried good equipment. Again, I sold this stuff for a living in the 80s and 90s. I was literally surrounded by thousands of pieces of analog audio equipment at all price points every day for about a decade. I guarantee I've tried more good equipment than most, I just hadn't actually owned a Walkman cassette player before. A better player than the ones I have will be more reliable, though not necessarily stress-free in 2023, and could sound better than either of these. But that's not difficult to do. You know what else would sound better than either of these, or even a better Walkman? A compact disc player, a mini disc player, even an early MP3 player. Basically anything that came after the Walkman. I wasn't buying a cassette Walkman for sound quality, but just to play some tapes I already have. I just got a little caught up in trying to improve things probably beyond what these Walkmen are currently capable of. At least not without some tiny replacement parts that I don't have or have access to, and probably couldn't properly work with even if I did. But they are still cool little devices, and they look fantastic on a shelf. The black one is working well enough to play my tapes once in a while. And at some point, when I have a full day with nothing to do, I'll give the silver one a deeper service and see if it improves. I doubt I'll ever get rid of my tapes at this point. A lot of them have memories associated with them, and with the experience of listening to that specific cassette. And a few are just not available on any other format. They were one and done. So it's still nice to have some kind of portable cassette player that I can at least use. By the way, a little addendum after I'd written the main script. The new battery cover I got for the Silver Walkman? Yep, it's already loosened up and just falls off. I might be able to just heat up and bend the lugs back in place, but it's a 3D printed thing and it'll probably never be strong enough. By the way, since I filmed this video, a bunch of 3D printed battery covers for the WMF100 series have shown up on AliExpress and consequently eBay at slightly inflated prices. These look pretty much the same as the 3D printed cover I bought, just without the battery already in it. That cover ended up not being durable enough to even last for six months sitting on a shelf in an air-conditioned room, so I'm still holding out for a real Sony battery cover. Oh well, maybe the next time the Mets win the World Series, I'll have actually found a proper battery cover for this thing. But if anyone has the 3D print files for this cover, let me know. I just haven't found them, but I could probably reprint it myself with better filament. Anyway, that's about all I got for now. I will see you guys next time.